Everyone should have a little packet of stuff that got handed out. And, uh, and what I'd like to share today is something that I've been kind of exploring and working on for, for quite a while, but it's recently kind of come to a new catalyzing point. And uh, I noticed that, uh, some of my other colleagues in this so-called rock block um, mentioned that, you know, the thing you need to know about me. And I guess if there's one thing you need to know about me, it's that I'm a wonderer. I wonder a lot. I design, you know, I drive, I do other human regular things, but I actually do wonder. And I look up at the clouds and I kind of think about things. I wonder about big things like, you know, where's technology going? And, and did I, is that interaction going to work for the customers that we're designing it for? And I wonder about little things like where I put my keys. Um, and, but part of it is I wonder about creativity and I wonder about the, the activity of having ideas, both as individuals and as part of a community of practice. And in the field that we're in, that's increasingly uh, the skill that we need to be able to make sure is always, we're always on our game. And I like to think about ideas and having ideas uh, as like breathing, right? You start with questions, you breathe the questions in, and then somehow you breathe those ideas out. And it's kind of an iterative process, and it goes back and forth, and ideas and questions come in all different shapes and sizes. But it's that process of breathing and being really good at it that I think is part of an exchange with the world. And working in creative teams, how we can facilitate our own creative exchanges, I think is part of what it means to be in an organization that can learn, that can advance, that can solve hard problems when they come up, and that can constantly be thinking about new ways to, to, to approach the problems that, as Cameron said earlier in the talk, the new problems that come up every day. So I also like to think about ideas a little bit like sex, right? So you want to have a lot of them, and you want them to be really awesome every time, and you want to have them with great people. So with that kind of as our foundation, uh, I thought we could structure the time today a little bit as breathing in, breathing out. So for the first half of the day, or the, our session together, I'll be breathing out and telling you some things. And in the second half, you'll be breathing out, and we'll be sharing things together by capturing some of our own knowledge and um, what we do in our own organizations to foster a creative culture. So speaking of wondering, this was a catalyzing event. I was about to get on a plane, and I was in the bookstore. I love Harvard Business Review, and with a title like Harvard Business Review on Breakthrough Thinking, how can you go wrong? So I bought this book, and I was, I was reading it on the plane, and this one article really stood out. This is an article called How to Kill Creativity. Like, that's just a buzz kill right there. But it was fascinating, and this was written in 1998. The uh, Harvard Business Review imprint is a kind of a, a collection, a curatorial collection of past articles that have been published in the mag. And Dr. Teresa Amido, <coughs> Amabile uh, is a researcher who's been working on organizational creativity for over 35 years. So she has this ginormous body of really interesting work about organizational and personal uh, creativity. And as I was reading it, not only is her work very well-founded, a lot of anecdotal, but also empirical evidence from organizations, but it also had this really beautiful structure to it. And I just couldn't get it out of my mind, and I had to put it down there because I thought, you know, if this was in some kind of visual framework kind of form, I wonder if I could use this to be more knowledgeable and thoughtful about the kind of everyday practices we do at Adaptive Path and get better at them, make sure we don't lose anything with some of our activities that reinforce the creative culture, and fill in some of the gaps that I know we have. So into this thing. So this thing is an accounting of, uh, of the article with some extensions and enhancements based on my experience at Adaptive Path that kind of tries to structure the, what's at play within an environment of creativity and specifically a creative culture. And <clears throat> the way that it's framed is about, is in three kind of major ways. So the idea is that th this blueprint can work as, as kind of a guide for a creative culture because it frames it in three, th in three big chunks. One, how do you get it? How do you, create a, how do you initially create a creative culture? The second one is how do you nourish it, foster it? And the third one is how do you support it? And those sound like they might all be the same thing, but there are some really different interesting principles at play with those. So after I made this framework, <clears throat> I went through a bunch of our activities. This is just a little bit of a side project. Um, behaviors and practices, things we do at Adaptive Path to see why were these things working? I don't know if you experience this, but occasionally there's a behavior or a meeting or an activity you do as a company, 
and you think, oh, that feels like us, it feels right. And then someone comes in and they want to change it or, or your organization grows and it's not working any longer and you think, well, we can't get rid of that. That's like our heart and soul. You can't really put your finger on why. And I found that by using this kind of blueprint as a framework, I could better understand why. And that meant we were okay to mix things up and change things when they needed to be changed. There wasn't that fear of losing something really important. So I'm just gonna walk through a little bit of the structure of, uh, of the blueprint. It's divided into three different zones. First ones, they're all labeled, but they're very teeny print, as Peter said. Uh, <clears throat> so the first zone is what creates a creative culture, what feeds it, and then the last one, what supports it. And then if you do any reading around creative literature or um, kind of the nature of, of how ideation and, and new things happen in organizational structures, you'll probably recognize things like this. So there's the second piece of the structure of these areas, and there's nine of them. And they have these big broad words, right, like expertise, creative thinking skills or motivation. There's huge bodies of work just on these topics alone. Challenge, freedom, resources, and they all sound so great, but when you start to actually put your mind around what that means, it gets very, it gets, it's too abstract. You kind of can't connect to it. I don't know what freedom looks like at Adaptive Path. I think I have it, but I don't really know. Especially in the organizational structure section. So the work group features, well, we all got them, whether or not they're good, right? But what does that really mean? And a lot of the literature kind of stays at this level and then gives you great anecdotes and examples. But it doesn't give you something to play with, some tool or some kind of system, as BJ Hogg might, might reference. So the cool part about the article and the extensions to it are there's actually these 32 elements that sit underneath those areas that start to give more specificity in life. These are things like passion, which admittedly is still pretty open and broad, but there's examples, there's little bits of that that, can, that are actually help you say, oh, I, I know how I can work on that in the organization, or I, I can see that. Things like time for exploration. If I asked you, Perry, do you have time for exploration in your design creative practice at your work? No, he would say no, but he'd have an answer, right? But if I said, do you have resources? Well, yeah, but like that doesn't mean anything. So things like goals that don't shift, as we all know, hard. Thank you, by the way, for the call. <laughs> and time for exploration. Those are things that, that research has shown really are important to foster a sense of creative practice, freshness, and enliveningness. And then under the organization section, things like mandating information sharing is one that occurred. And it's just one example that companies who have essentially forced or mandated information sharing have started to see really different responses in how their, their communities of practice start to interrelate and cross-pollinate ideas. And so using this blueprint, you can, there's two major ways that I've been playing with it, and I'm kind of, this is all part of a greater experiment to see how, how far this can go. You can use it as an assessment tool. So you can go through, look at some of the elements that are at play, and say, how do we do that? Do we do that thing? Do we have time for exploration? Yes, no? You can use it to kind of figure out a gap analysis for yourself. Or you can also use it as an ideation tool. What kinds of activities or practices could we do every day that can be simple, cheap, and become part of our everyday habitualized activity that could reinforce or promote this activity. And then the kicker is making sure you were working at the right level of scale, right? So activities still is pretty an open term, but things like meetings, um, resources or rooms, physical space, conferences like this would be considered an activity, a place where you can go, get outside of your own design challenges and, so and socialize around ideas. Routines, behaviors, policies are also activities. And by putting these two pieces to work, you can actually start to play with and craft your own creative culture. So I'm gonna walk through just about three different examples because you know what's coming, right? I'm gonna ask you to, to write one of these down from what your own culture is. So start thinking. And hopefully if you had a chance to even take a glance at it, you'll already have a little bit of a preview. But I wanna walk you through three that are part of the 57 that I've collected both from Adaptive Path, interviews with people, as well as um, just magazines and articles that I've been reading. And the first, so the blueprint of one of these like note cards or capturing this activity is to just write it down in as simple basic terms as possible. Like this actually isn't rocket science, 
they're things that we forget about because they're so much part of our daily routine. So here's one called Five Minute Madness. We do this at Adaptive Path. It's a session of five minutes where you pose a question that you think may or may not be true. And then we do this at our company meetings once a month. And there's six slots. You sign up. And for five minutes, the group discusses that question. But the kicker is, you have to kind of say something you don't think is true, or might not be true, or you're not sure. So it's automatically kind of an odd thing to be doing. After the group discusses it, five minutes, stop sign goes up, you're done. But it's been a little bit of that getting it out there, starting to foster other conversations. And what's interesting about this is when you start to take it and deconstruct it and put it against the creative blueprint, some really important fundamental pieces start to emerge. Right? So departing from the status quo. You have to say something you think isn't true, so you're not going to, it's a place where group think can't be the number one, it can't be the informing part of the question. You're forced to get out of your comfort zone. It encourages diverse perspectives in our work groups because you're used to listening to a different perspective and point of view. In fact, you expect it. It reinforces, reinforces open communication. Makes, it says that our company meetings, this is a place where you can say something, not be sure, but rely on the group social aspect to help you make those ideas better. For the recipients or the listeners, it helps you meet things with an open mind. So you hear something that, holy crap, that's wrong. But you're there, and you're able to actually balance and practice not having that gut no reaction, that negative bias. And honestly, without five minute madness, I don't think I'd be standing up here doing something, an activity in a venue I've never done before with more people than I've ever done it before. Because really, five minute madness is about taking risks. It's kind of hard to stand up in front of your colleagues and say, um, here's something I don't think is true. It's even worse to kind of be wrong or think you're wrong in front of your colleagues. But you know, if you practice, you can get really good at it, as I have learned. So that's one of them. The second is something that many companies do, and I hope that this is, um, will make the activity part of it feel pretty accessible. It's brown bags, right? Someone from either the organization or outside the organization comes in. You have lunch. You listen to what they got to say. Uh, <clears throat> Google puts theirs on video. A lot of the other big companies down south in Silicon Valley have open ones that public can come to. And again, when you put this against some of the practices, you hear, you start to realize it's firing on different levels. So we've heard from a variety of futurists, um, people doing interesting research, and what it does is it gets us out of our own problem space and helps us understand themes and trends in other problem spaces. And that's part of that creative thinking skill set that we need to have. We also ask folks if they want to share their portfolio. You know, it's like any time you join an organization, it's like that person's brand new when they walk in and they've never done anything before unless they insist on telling you about it, right? But this is a chance to kind of have a little bit of a ride along to who they were before. That means you can get to know their skills and abilities in a way that might not come up naturally within the course of your work together. <clears throat> also, ad hoc working sessions, just working with people that you don't always have an opportunity to work with can smooth quite a bit of those paths when you are in a critical project and you have to have a good working relationship based on honesty and an open mind. And then the last one, and this is directly uh, a kind of an assault against um, many colleagues who feel that meetings are essentially the death knell of any kind of productive behavior, right? Like if you show up in meetings, worse yet, standing meetings, God forbid, you meet once a week to talk to people that you work with, right? But as part of our sales consulting meeting, we do a few things within the body of that meeting that I think are unusual. So the name of this activity is weekly consulting sales meeting. And when we apply that against uh, this creative blueprint, we see that we actually have conversations around the fit between practitioners and the nature of the creative work that's, that's up for um, a possibility to work on from the point of adaptive path. We actually intentionally talk about that. We don't talk necessarily about the approach and the fit, but we talk about how we get to a better approach and fit. We talk philosophically about it. We also try and match people with assignments. People are able to stand up and say, that's interesting to me. I've done something like that. That's a creative problem I want to help solve. It's very hard to get that kind of leverage and, and even that kind of insight or uh, feedback in many companies. And if you make a place for it, it'll happen. And then kind of natural collections of, of working teams start to emerge. It also helps us know each other's passions. 
So even if you don't work on a project that strikes at that heart of the passion, I know what it is. I can find out what Paul is interested in, or Pam, or Peter, or any of the colleagues, because they're actually vocal about it. They're used to stating what they expect in the world, and that makes it more likely to happen. And that paves the way for shared excitement. When you are working on a project, you know that when times get rough, people wake up and they say, I signed up for this because I'm interested and I care. So looking at the weekly consulting meeting and saying, wow, I think that's actually a driver of some pretty core fundamental creative behaviors in our organization was a real wake-up call for me. And I hadn't expected that kind of follow-up and feedback from a, admittedly a very simple list of stuff kind of put together in a visual model. So then the next question is, if you're going to plus it or do something more with it, how can we generate more of these things and capture more activities like this and then socialize them? Because someone's organization might think, oh, it's old hat to have brown bags, but another organization, that might just be that small, simple behavior that could start to move things around. And thus was born this lightning session of rapid collaboration. And so all you need to do such a thing is a visual prompt, something to write on and write with, and a whole bunch of awesome, smart people, all with individual ideas that just aren't connected yet. So the instructions, we're going to now for the, for the breathing, I'm going to start breathing in, and you guys are going to start breathing out your creativity and your insights, is a 10-minute activity. And if you think that's short, it's okay, that's like four YouTube videos, right? <laughs> think how, or even TED videos, right? So you can get a lot done in 10 minutes if you're focused. So we're going to bring the lights up. I want you to look through the teeny tiny little print, but it is clear, it's just quite small. And look around for something that seems to make sense. None of this is, is complex or uh, it should feel fairly obvious. But look for something that you guys do. Do you feel like your money is appropriate amount? Are there principles or practices in your company that help that be true? Human resources policies even? That might be something you want to work on. How does your organization communicate that the work matters? So just take a look through this. Pick an element and then think about an activity. How does that actually take form in the world? So if you have mutual support, how does that actually start to happen? When I was test driving this on, um, on a friend who works in a completely different field, he was irritated and said, you know, we don't have a creative culture, we don't have a creative company, I don't want to do this anymore. And he said, and I'm like, well, do you, when you work with people, how do you know that you guys are supporting each other when times get rough? He goes, well, we know each other really well. We go to lunch every day as a team, their whole team, every day. I was like, well, that's an activity. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah. You go to lunch every day. You guys are actually there for each other. And then the last simple step is just to write it down. Really basic. It might be a brown bag. It might be having lunch. It might be that thing that helps get more exploration space or sticking to deadlines. Holy crap, if anyone here has some good thoughts on that, I think there's going to be a really, really wild audience for those. We're going to do this in 10 minutes. And the result of this work, after we've captured things like this, is going to be a whole bunch of things like this. Hopefully, 200, 300, 350, everybody does one. That's a lot of really big ideas to start to, or little ideas even, to start to look through. We're going to take 10 minutes for that, and then I'll tell you what the next step in my commitment back to you is going to be. So how are we going to make the most of what you just did and your efforts and contributions? Well, I don't know yet because we don't know what we're, I don't know what's going to come out of this. But I suspect, coming from a UX practice, that there will be cards and they will be stacked or sorted in some way. Okay? They might even be clustered. There might even more than, be more than one cluster and they will hopefully be associated with areas across this structure, which means that we can use it now as kind of a collection of um, areas, if you look through and do some gap analysis, of areas that you do want to invest some of your time and efforts in and uh, have some simple and clear and proven ideas for what you can do in your own organizations. And that always brings up, <clears throat> at the last point, is like, what's the point of this anyway? 
And any time I think about a creative culture, we talk about it, it becomes this kind of its own idea on itself, and you can't disconnect that from the bigger picture. So a little bit back to the clouds. Imagine every day waking up and being part, not only participating in, but actually actively helping form, foster, nourish, and support an environment that's open where people really can get the best ideas out there and collectively can co-create those. When we can do that with customers, we can do that with other people out in the world. And what that lets us do as designers, right? How that generosity, how that openness, how that really that spirit of living and, and learning in public to always get to that best idea, not your idea, but that best idea, can actually help make great experiences for others. So we are on our way to lunch. I want to give a shout out to all the creative contributors who have brought this work this far. Um, Dr. Teresa Amavile for her catalyzing article, of course, the Harvard Business Review, some other folks at Adaptive Path who I rely on, and of course, you. And what I'm going to do is scan all these articles and or all the, the um, contributions that you've made and put them together in some semblance of function and have something available by the end of UX week, okay? So on your way out, we've got volunteers at the door and you can just drop your ideas off there or at the uh, information afterwards, anytime during the week. Okay, thank you for your time. <laughs>